Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Sanjay Bindra. Dr. Sanjay Bindra is board certified in cardiovascular medicine, cardiac electrophysiology, and internal medicine. Dr. Bindra attended medical school at University of Bombay, India. He completed his residency at Los Angeles County and the University of Southern California. Dr. Bindra completed his fellowship at St. Luke's Medical Center and Aurora Sinai in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as well as Los Angeles County and the University of Southern California. Dr. Bindra currently practices medicine in the field of cardiology. So today I'm talking about uh, a very uh, uh, a common uh, cardiovascular condition. Uh, with the aging population, we are going to see uh, more individuals afflicted uh, with this condition, and that is atrial fibrillation. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist and uh, uh, my son uh, feels that all these names are tongue twisters and what does electrophysiology uh, uh, mean? So the electrophysiologists essentially are specialists in heart rhythm disturbances and we manage patients with medications, procedures and so forth. So this is a subspecialty of cardiology. So cardiology is broadly divided into non-invasive or invasive and in invasive there are interventionalists uh, who perform angioplasties and stents and electrophysiologists who deal with heart rhythm abnormality. So I've divided this uh, topic, uh, I'll give a brief introduction of atrial fibrillation, talk about some of the most important issues in this condition. One of the key issues is, as you all know, is stroke and how does one reduce the risk of stroke and then what are the common treatments and then what is the role of ablation uh, which I specialize in. So atrial fibrillation is a very common problem. With the aging population, roughly one in four individuals is at risk for atrial fibrillation if they reach 40. If someone has a prior history of cardiac condition with heart failure or a prior myocardial infarction, their risk is one in six. This is more prevalent problem than say breast cancer or hip fracture. And with the aging population, this problem is only going to increase. And the reason for that is uh, multifold. Part of it is related to the aging process in the heart itself, much like as we uh, get more mature seeing many summers or hair changes, we have a receding hairline. I've started uh, to show some signs of that. Uh, similarly, changes take place in the atrium wherein in the upper tissue, in the upper chamber of the heart, there are changes which take place which predispose the individual to this rhythm disturbance. This is not directly a fatal rhythm unlike ventricular fibrillation which is a fatal rhythm some patients with this rhythm disturbance are asymptomatic and they are just discovered during incidental evaluations and some individuals are very sick with this condition. High blood pressure, diabetes, lung disease all increase the chances that some individual will develop atrial fibrillation. And this is schooled uh, to the elder, uh, elder, elder individuals. Majority of patients with atrial fibrillation are above the age of 65. There are some individuals though who are young 
and can have intermittent atrial fibrillation as well. And those are in smaller portions as compared to the entire population. Currently in the US, uh, we have more than 2 million patients uh, with atrial fibrillation diagnosed. And there is a huge uh, burden of patients who are undiagnosed who, who have this condition as well. So, so the numbers are very high. One of the reasons we as physicians are very concerned uh, about atrial fibrillation is the risk for stroke. Patients with atrial fibrillation, if they suffer a stroke, this stroke is worse than individuals who do not have this condition. These are the strokes which sends grandma to the nursing home. More than half of patients with these strokes have disabling strokes, if not fatal strokes. These strokes involve a clot which is formed in the upper chamber of the heart. And this is the structure in which the clot forms. This is an autopsy specimen of the heart which has been cut open to show us the various chambers. This is the left upper chamber which we call the left atrium. And this structure which my arrow is pointing out is the left atrial appendage. So in atrial fibrillation there is chaotic activity of the upper chamber of the heart. The heart which was previously used to beating at 60 to 100 times per minute in response to activity is suddenly quivering in the upper chamber and beating as as high as 500 times a minute. And since the blood doesn't flow well, in the upper chamber clots form. Fortunately, when the upper chamber is beating fast, the lower chamber doesn't beat that fast because otherwise we would all be dead because the lower chamber can't beat that fast. There's a bridge between the upper and lower chamber of the heart, what we call the AV node, which essentially slows down the conduction to the lower chamber. So in other words, when the upper chamber is quivering, it exposes the individual to formation of a clot. And fortunately, since there is a speed breaker which Mother Nature has given us, the lower chamber does not beat that fast. And depends on how good or how weak that conduction is, which determines how fast your lower chamber beats, which determines your pulse. So one of the key uh, uh, clinical signs of atrial fibrillation is that we'll ask the patient if they can check their pulse. The pulse in atrial fibrillation is irregularly irregular because the atria is quivering and impulses make their way to the lower chamber. So this is the structure uh, which, is, which my arrow shows, the sac-like structure called the left atrial appendage. 90% of all strokes in atrial fibrillation occur from clots and 90% of these clots actually sit in this structure called the left atrial appendage. And when they leave the left atrial appendage, then often their destination in 90% of patients is actually the brain. And that's where these clots dis, uh, dislodge from the heart and block one of the artery which supplies blood to the brain, giving a massive stroke. So this slide illustrates that 90% of all clots in atrial fibrillation are found in the structure which we call the appendage. And uh, this is the cause of uh, massive strokes. This is one of the autopsy specimen, wherein the appendage has been splayed open. And you can see a clot. This is uh, the size of this clot is going to decide how big the artery it's going to occlude. So if it's a small clot, it's going to travel distally and affect a small area of the brain. If it's a large clot, it's going to obstruct proximally and affect a huge area of the brain. Uh, with that uh, area not getting enough blood supply and that patient is going to present with stroke-like symptoms, either weakness, numbness, inability or difficulty in speaking or swallowing. Fortunately though, we have treatment for this condition. One of the key goals in management of atrial fibrillation is to reduce the risk for stroke. So when patients come to see me in the office, I tell them, uh, the first thing that I'm concerned about is to reduce your risk of stroke. It doesn't matter to me whether you have symptoms or you do not have symptoms. You have an equivalent risk of stroke. In other words, some patients atrial fibrillation is incidentally discovered. And in some patients, they are very sick from it. It doesn't matter if they, are, they feel unwell or they feel well in, with this condition. The risk for stroke is dictated by the atria not beating well.
So all patients need to be evaluated for reduction of risk of stroke. I'm sure uh, uh, some of you have heard of this medicine called warfarin. For the last five to six decades, this is the only blood thinner that we've had. Actually, the uh, discovery of this medicine is interesting. Uh, uh, a Minnesota farmer should be credited for the discovery of this medicine. It was actually during the depression years when after a, a long winter, uh, which uh, the Midwest often experiences, uh, in the summer, uh, this uh, farmer noted that his cattle were bleeding to death. So he found that there is a specific type of hay which was new, which was introduced, and uh, secondary to the rains, uh, there was mold on it. And that could have possibly been the cause of this, his cattle bleeding. So he brought this whole huge stack of hay to this biochemist uh, who then essentially uh, re uh, realized that in the height of the Great Depression, uh, having cattle which are going to bleed in a farming town is going to have huge economic consequences. So he essentially studied the problem and came up with this derivative and subsequently led to the discovery of warfarin. Initially, it was used as a rat poison, and when later on medicinal application was realized that this medicine made its way as a blood thinner. When Eisenhower suffered from a heart attack and he received this medicine, then it became ready for use for, uh, for the rest of the country. If the president could get it, so could other individuals as well. So that started an era for warfarin. And for the last five to six decades, that's the only blood thinner that we've had. Uh, albeit for the last few years, we've had newer medications coming, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. Because there's a lot of uh, misinformation uh, in the lawyer ads which, have been, uh, which I'm sure all of you have heard. Warfarin is a very effective medicine. One of the ways we physicians uh, 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 classify medicines in their effectiveness is their risk reduction. So you can see that warfarin reduces the risk of stroke by almost close to three-fourths. Versus aspirin. Aspirin is not a blood thinner. It's an antiplatelet medicine. And the risk reduction with aspirin is very inferior, almost close to 20% as compared to 68% with warfarin. And some studies have doubted the efficacy of aspirin in atrial fibrillation. It's a good medicine for reduction of uh, arterial events, events which occur in the artery like heart attacks. But it's a poor drug for reduction of stroke for atrial fibrillation. For other conditions, aspirin may be fine. But if a patient has atrial fibrillation, the person in, needs a blood thinner, which aspirin is not. One of the ways uh, we physicians stratify risk, in other words, not all patients are equal. Some individuals have higher risk, and some individuals have lower risk for a, for, for a stroke. And any blood thinner comes with it the risk of bleeding problems. What I tell patients is that when I'm starting you on the blood thinner, what I'm doing is that I'm buying a bleeding problem to prevent a stroke. For every stroke that I prevent with this blood thinner, I'm going to cause one or two episodes of bleeding. But once you have a stroke and if you present late, there is no treatment. And it could possibly be a major stroke which is going to leave you, into, leave you in a nursing home. But for bleeding, we do have treatment. We can interrupt the medicine. We can find out where the bleeding is from, stop the bleeding. It may involve a hospital stay. But we can treat it if you show up early. But if we do not treat you with a blood thinner, you are exposed to the risk of a disabling stroke. So the patients are educated about that. And the embolic risk, in other words, their stroke risk, is there are various tools that we use to identify who's at high risk. Someone who's elderly has the, is a higher risk of stroke. Someone who has high blood pressure, who has diabetes, who has weakness in his heart muscles, has congestive heart failure, or who's 
suffered already with either a mini stroke or a major stroke previously is at much higher risk than someone who does not have any of these conditions. And we score, uh, we have a scoring pattern uh, which, uh, which helps us identify the risk. The higher the score, higher the risk. So the individuals with atrial fibrillation are at a five-fold higher risk for stroke as compared to individuals who do not have this condition. Some individuals, the risk of stroke is 1%, and for some individuals, the risk could be as high as 20% per year. How do these medicines work? So the, as, we, as we know, warfarin is a very effective medicine. It's taken in a pill form with a prescribed dose, and it essentially works in the liver where the coagulation proteins are formed. It interferes with the, for, with the activation is of these proteins, so it helps to make the blood thin, if you may. In other words, it assists in reduction of clot formation, and that's how it works. Since it works on the liver, it takes some time for it to reduce these proteins. So warfarin doesn't work right away. It takes three to five days and often about a week before when we start it till when the blood becomes thin. And in some situations, the doctor may also give you some injectable medicine along with it, which works right away while warfarin is taking effect. Warfarin, as we know, is a very effective medicine, but the safety data of warfarin in clinical practice leaves much to be desired. One of the issues with warfarin is that every individual is different. The enzymes which metabolize are different. There is a lot of drug-drug interaction. There is a lot of food-drug interaction. If some, of, so if some of you take warfarin, you know that uh, when you get started on it, you're educated about vitamin K in the diet, which can interfere with the action of this medicine. The same individual at different times may require a different dose of warfarin. So there are some patients in my practice who take warfarin one milligram a day. There are some who need 10 times that amount. And one needs to keep them in a tight control, what we call the INR, the international normalized ratio. The level needs to be kept between two and three. So when the levels are low, the blood is not adequately thin, so you're not protected. And when the levels are high, meaning that your blood is very thin, then you're at risk for bleeding problems. So, so this medicine, although very effective, needs to be taken carefully. Any new medicine, over-the-counter or prescription, if it is introduced, the physician and the pharmacist need to be notified about it. And if you change your diet, your need of the medication, the dosage of the medication may change. Just because your seemingly alike friend takes a particular dose doesn't mean that that's the dose that you're going to need. So essentially there is a lot of what we call intrapersonal variability, differences within the same person at different times, and a lot of interpersonal variability. In other words, different individuals require different dose. So for a long time, we as physicians have been waiting for a medicine which can be given in a more convenient fashion. And patients too uh, have been hoping for a medicine which is a fixed dose, does not require frequent blood checks. Uh, the issue with warfarin has, it has been that it's been underutilized because of the obvious reasons. Uh, an individual who's given warfarin needs to comply with dietary restrictions, medica medication uh, review, and uh, is exposed to the risk of uh, bleeding problems. Studies have shown that less than half of patients who are candidates for warfarin receive them, and less than half of them are adequately treated. So there's a huge gap between what we should be doing and what we are doing. There are newer strategies now. There are newer blood thinners which are on the horizon over the last three years. Each year we've seen a new blood thinner come uh, approved by the FDA and this is going to continue for the next few years. So a lot of research has yielded good results 
giving us more convenient alternatives. And then there are some procedures which are on the horizon, which are not approved by the FDA yet, which may offer some uh, 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 alternative to warfarin in the near future. Since most of these clots form in the structure called the left atrial appendage, there are ways uh, we as physicians are researching about closing this structure where the clots form so as to reduce the risk for stroke. And FDA should be reviewing uh, one of the da data from one of the devices at the end of the year and we'll have more information. But for now, we do have newer blood thinners. This is one of the landmark uh, journal articles from New England uh, Journal of Medicine uh, in 2009, uh, the same year uh, we went through a financial crisis. Uh, Dabigatran, which is Pradaxa, got uh, approved. This is one of the newer blood thinners, which works differently as compared to warfarin. It acts on one of the final steps before a clot is formed, and it thins the blood. It acts rapidly. The drug's half-life is about 12 to 15 hours, and the drug reaches therapeutic action right away. In other words, when I give the medicine, the blood is thin right away. Similarly, when you stop the medicine, the, blood, uh, the, the effectiveness of the blood thinner goes away rapidly, which, which is convenient in, in some situations. If the kidney function, which, which this drug depends on for excretion, is, is okay, and there are ways to measure that by a simple blood test, most patients require a fixed dose of the medicine. And so this is more convenient. There are not many drug-drug interactions identified. There are no food-drug interactions. And the pharmacokinetics, this is doctor's lingo of saying, how the body uh, uh, treats the drug, and pharmacodynamics means that how the drug treats the body are, are very stable, unlike uh, the alternative in which there is a lot of variability. So, there, so, so this medicine is essentially as effective, if not better, than warfarin, and it's as safe if not better than warfarin. Remember that any blood thinner is going to expose individuals to the risk of bleeding problems. There's another group of medicines now. Two of them are already approved by the FDA. The most latest one was approved a few weeks ago. This, this group also similar to dabigatran uh, is also convenient to take. It's oral, in other words, it's in a uh, uh, it has to be ingested, and one of the medicine needs to be taken once a day, the other needs to be taken twice a day, and again, uh, the drug needs the kidneys for excretion, so the doctor will check your kidney function to determine your dose, and the dose is fixed, and there's not much of drug-drug, uh, there's not much of food-drug interaction and limited drug-drug interaction. So these are what we call cleaner drugs. What about uh, devices? Uh, there are devices which are on the horizon in this structure, as, as I mentioned, the left atrial appendage, uh, where the clots form. A device uh, uh, is being studied, which essentially can close this structure to reduce the risk of stroke. The FDA is going to review the uh, safety data, and we'll have more information at the end of the year. So now we talked about patients who come in with atrial fibrillation. Right at the offset, we are trying to reduce their risk of stroke. But often patients come to our office with complaints, you know. Uh, they are either feeling unwell with the condition, and often the symptoms could be palpitations. They feel that their heart is racing. They may, may, they may feel unwell with shortness of breath. Uh, they, they feel winded. They can't walk much as compared to what they were able to do before. And some of them come in very sick and are seen in the emergency room with uh, inability to breathe, and they need uh, uh, support for that. Or some come in with complaints of chest pain because the heart is beating so fast that they, uh, their demands are high, and they suffer these symptoms. <clears throat> 
Some individuals though, as I mentioned, may be asymptomatic. In other words, they may be incidentally discovered to have atrial fibrillation. And some may actually suffer from a condition what we call tachycardia cardiomyopathy. That's doctors uh, speaking for weakness in the heart muscle which got uh, introduced because of the heart beating too fast. And this is a reversible condition when we slow the heart down back to normal rates, the heart will strengthen back again. Small number of patients uh, have this problem, but we are recognizing more and more individuals who could be afflicted with this. And the good part of this is that treatment will reverse the weakness in the heart muscle. So as we said in atrial fibrillation, the upper chamber is quivering. The impulses make their way to the lower chamber. The lower chamber can beat at a variable rate depending on what the AV node, which is the bridge which Mother Nature has given us, will, will allow impulses to go through. And depending on how fast their lower chamber is beating, that dictates often how well or how unwell the patients feel. We have treatment uh, for these symptoms. So uh, many decades ago, all that we had was uh, a derivative from foxglove, which was digoxin. Now we have multiple medicines which we can give, which are both safe and effective. We divide these medicines in two broad groups when I'm treating patients. One, what we call rate control medicines and the other what we call rhythm control medicines or antiarrhythmic drugs. These are two distinct groups. If patients who are otherwise feeling uh, well or, or who have some discomfort but which is mild, which is easily controlled, your doctor is more than likely going to start you on what we call rate control medicines. In other words, he's going to let you stay in atrial fibrillation, give you a blood thinner if you're a candidate for, and then try to improve your symptoms by slowing your heart rate by giving you some medicines like beta blockers, that's one group, and calcium channel blockers, which is another group, like metoprolol, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that medicine, and diltiazem. These are the commonly used medicines. These are safe, they are effective, and uh, uh, the dosages need to be titrated. In other words, they'll start you on a low dose and then gradually increase that. Some patients, though in atrial fibrillation, are very sick. And even giving them these rate control medicines, despite that, they feel unwell because they depend a lot on the kick from the atrium, which they lose when they are in atrial fibrillation. So they need to be converted to sinus rhythm, it means the normal rhythm like other individuals. So what we do is that we introduce what we call rhythm control medicines, which are antiarrhythmic drugs. And some of these drugs have a lot of drug side effects, which we need to monitor these patients for. Some of them have organ toxicity uh, type of side effects too. And then these, uh, we introduce blood thinners, introduce these patients on these simple rate control medicines and some antiarrhythmic drugs. And then, then often we'll perform a procedure called cardioversion, wherein you come from home on an empty stomach, the anesthesiologist gives you a medicine uh, to sleep, and the, the cardiologist or electrophysiologist performs a cardioversion, means that passes electrical energy through the heart to sink your heart back to normal rhythm, to bring you back to sinus rhythm. So there, there, there was a lot of debate in literature, what is better, you know? You can either be a Democrat or a Republican, so you're either a rate control physician or a rhythm control physician. There was not much clarity on who needed what. Fortunately for us, over the last decade, we've had multiple studies which have been conducted and they've come out with the same message. This was a landmark study which randomized, in other words, we s separated individuals in either a rate control arm or a rhythm control arm. In other words, give them either simple medicines or give them these uh, antiarrhythmic drugs and to see 
whether there was a mortality benefit to one arm or the other. In other words, do individuals, if they are treated in, a, in one manner, live longer than the other? The study showed that it didn't really matter which arm you were in, whether you were in the rate control arm or in the rhythm control arm. You did uh, equally fine as compared to mortality. So in other words, if an individual is otherwise feeling okay, simple medicines like rate control medicines are fine. This study, of course, did not include individuals who are very sick in atrial fibrillation who needed to be in normal rhythm. So this does not mean that every individual needs to be treated this way, but a significant majority of patients can be treated with simple rate control treatment. As I mentioned, antiarrhythmic drugs have their issues as well. One of the key issues is, is efficacy. In other words, uh, how long will the individual stay in normal rhythm? So we start this medicine, we convert them to normal, and a majority, uh, a significant majority of patients is going to revert back into atrial fibrillation within the first year. More than 30 to 50 percent of individuals will revert back. So the efficacy leaves a lot to be desired, and these drugs do come with side effects. So the physician carefully chooses a patient to be put on antiarrhythmic drugs. And for some patients, uh, this is the only way that they can stay out of the hospital because each time they go into atrial fibrillation, they feel so unwell that they need to visit the hospital. Most patients of atrial fibrillation, though, can be easily managed. And I encourage patients to actually recognize their symptoms and calm down and not build up on anxiety when they're in atrial fibrillation and panic and come to the emergency room if they're otherwise feeling well. But if they're having chest pain, they are feeling lightheaded, dizzy, about to faint, or they are having severe difficulty breathing, then of course they need rapid relief and they should come to the emergency room. But if they are fe just feeling their heart quiver a little bit, it's beating a little fast, that's what we expect in atrial fibrillation. So there's no need to rush to the emergency room. You can see your doctor in the office and adjust the dosage of the medicine. So the study, the AFFIRM study take home message was for a significant majority of patients, simple medicines is fine. And the other thing it also showed was that do not stop blood thinners just because you think you are in normal rhythm. What does that mean? So in atrial fibrillation comes in various uh, uh, presentations, in other words, uh, sometimes you'll see individual for the first episode of atrial fibrillation, what we call the first recognized episode, often we'll see individuals with recurrent episodes. In other words, intermittent atrial fibrillation. What does that mean? Is that in the interim, patients are in normal rhythm and at times go into atrial fibrillation, what we call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. That's doctor speak for intermittent atrial fibrillation. So these episodes could be maybe two episodes a year or two episodes a day. The frequency could vary. But that does not mean that that individual is at, is at a lower risk for stroke than someone who is in persistent atrial fibrillation. Means that means someone who is in atrial fibrillation all the time. This is not very intuitive, but that's what the studies have shown. In other words, if we have a patient who has a history of atrial fibrillation, it doesn't matter if the person has intermittent or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or has persistent or is in atrial fibrillation all the time. Both of these patients, group of patients, need to be on blood thinners to reduce the risk of stroke. Is that message clear? Since the uh, antiarrhythmic drugs leave a lot to be desired because there are a, sub, a subset of patients who are very symptomatic or not controlled. And as I mentioned, antiarrhythmic drugs do come with their side effects and the efficacy of these drugs is limited. There is research being conducted for decades on why do we have atrial fibrillation in the first place. Because if we understand that, then if we can modify some aspects on why it forms, then we can relieve these patients who have a lot of symptoms in this condition. 
the surgeons had devised a very effective method of taking care of this problem. Of course, this was restricted to individuals initially who were going in for open heart surgery for another reason. Often a valve replacement surgery if their valves were abnormal. So what the surgeon uh, devised was that compartmentalize the atrium much like a maze. In other words, that they cut and sew parts of the atrium, the upper chamber, in such a way that there's not enough tissue for atrial fibrillation to continue. What we call the maze procedure. This is a very effective procedure, but of course, if a patient uh, uh, doesn't need uh, an open heart surgery for another reason, this is too big a procedure. So there was always a search for minimalizing the procedure to see what could be done in a procedure lab with the patient asleep with catheters put in through small tubes called IV lines. The French, our French colleagues showed that for some patients with atrial fibrillation, it actually originates in the veins which bring blood into the heart and the veins which bring blood to the left upper chamber of the heart are the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary means they bring blood from the lungs as we know that when we take a deep breath the uh, blood gets purified, gets oxygenated and that blood makes its way to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins then goes into the left ventricle before the aorta which is the major pipe which sends blood to the rest of the body. So these pulmonary veins could be sources for atrial fibrillation for some patients. So then the question came in medical literature was, how can these tubes create these electrical abnormality? Because we all thought that only the heart could create an electrical rhythm, not the veins. How could the veins do that? We later realized is that the left atrium when we are in our mother's womb is essentially the left atrial appendage and later on uh, in pregnancy as the heart is formed the veins actually form the majority of the left atrium so essentially the veins continue into the atrium so that is the basis wherein the muscle sleeves from the atrium actually continue for a little distance in the veins and hence these veins can essentially fire uh, uh, abnormally in, in certain circumstances. They can create a trigger and the atrium can essentially sustain atrial fibrillation. In other words, can have a substrate, in other words, have a structure which can keep the atrial fibrillation going. So a few concepts are coming out, what we call triggers and what we call substrate. In other words, what creates this problem and what sustains this problem, yeah? Much like the financial crisis is that what created it and what sustained it because once we know about what the cause is, then we can produce appropriate intervention. So what the French colleagues uh, showed us is that we can actually go into the heart with catheters, identify from where these veins are firing erratically and then make a scar tissue there, quieten that vein and reduce these episodes of atrial fibrillation. That's essentially now with modifications what we are doing a decade later. So the patient is in the procedure lab through the veins, essentially through, through tubes uh, often in the leg we snake in catheters which are uh, long tubes into the heart under ultrasound and often x-ray vision and using a GPS system with a 3D mapping in the heart, maneuver catheters in the heart and, uh, and essentially isolate these veins which bring blood into the left upper chamber of the heart which fire electrically abnormally so that those impulses don't make their way into the atrium. So in the procedure lab, this is what electrophysiologists do. We spend hours looking at these squiggly lines, which essentially tell us 
uh, where the issues are, we identify that and essentially identify what we call a pulmonary vein potential and essentially bring in uh, energy source which is often a heat source from radio frequency and perform a procedure called ablation to isolate these veins from the upper chamber of the heart to reduce or eliminate atrial fibrillation in carefully selected patients who are good candidates for it. So often you know when I'm talking to patients who are candidates for the procedure of course they have multiple questions but often they'll ask me doctor where do you actually do this where in the heart do you do this so this is a specimen in which we have sliced uh, to show the left upper chamber of the heart and here you can actually see the vein which brings blood into the left atrium and you can see a trigger which is in this vein which has been represented which creates this abnormal circuit which gives this quivering in the upper chamber called atrial fibrillation. So what we do is that we put in a catheter here which helps us what we call a mapping catheter and we take another catheter which we call the ablation catheter which is our, uh, uh, which is our tool and we make scar tissue there. Uh, I use radio frequency energy, there is also cryo energy, in other words freezing tissue. There are multiple sources of energy which is being evaluated. Radio frequency is the most commonly, uh, 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 commonly used method of performing this procedure called ablation. So essentially what is done is that there is this muscle sleeve in this vein which we are targeting. The electrical signals help us identify these veins and we try to ablate more on the atrial side so as the vein doesn't narrow and create problems. So when I'm performing ablation this is what I'm doing. I'm essentially creating spot by spot by spot lesions to separate the pulmonary veins the, uh, electrically from the left atrium. And when I, when I talk to patients about the procedure, I tell them that a third of patients are going to need a second procedure. And the reason for that is that in the procedure when I'm making all these spots, then there may be gaps which may form because of inadequately completed line, which after the procedure when we check, it seems okay because there is also swelling associated with these lesions. But when they go home and the swelling subsides, some gaps may form and something which seemed isolated in the procedure lab and there are ways to assess that. We wait for periods of time and check electrically. Later on, a few weeks later, uh, it may still be incomplete and a third of patients will need another procedure to complete the line, if you may. Studies have shown that ablation is more effective for these patients than antiarrhythmic drug therapy, especially if a patient has already failed an antiarrhythmic drug. In other words, an individual who's already failed one drug, and if that individual is continued on drugs versus being uh, uh, prescribed ablation, you can see that most patients with antiarrhythmic drugs fail, but a significant portion of individuals with atrial fibrillation who are prescribed ablation therapy uh, are free of atrial fibrillation. Of course, the longer we monitor patients, the more we find atrial fibrillation. And one of the things that we've noted in clinical practice is that often patients who had atrial fibrillation which was very symptomatic, and if they do have atrial fibrillation after this ablation procedure, a significant portion of them are asymptomatic. So in other words, this procedure is more dictated to making the individuals feel better. So candidates for this procedure are patients who feel unwell in atrial fibrillation. If someone feels well already, I don't offer this procedure to patients because this is uh, 
restricted to individuals who are feeling unwell because all that we are trying to achieve is better symptom control, in other words, for individuals to feel better. Is that clear? So now, now that begs to the question is that who are appropriate candidates for this procedure? Whom should we offer this procedure to? So appropriate candidates for this procedure are individuals who have uh, often have intermittent atrial fibrillation, who go in and out of atrial fibrillation, who are uh, younger individuals uh, who have a lot of symptoms from atrial fibrillation. In other words, someone who has intermittent atrial fibrillation, who is not feeling well with the medicine, this these patients are good candidates for this. So should we offer AFib ablation to this individual who suffers atrial fibrillation? The answer is yes. In this patient, the likelihood of the veins being a cause for atrial fibrillation is very, very high because this individual likely does not have underlying heart disease. What about uh, this individual? Should we offer atrial fibrillation ablation to this? For this individual, which represents the majority of patients uh, that we see, the first approach is a uh, comprehensive approach. In other words, we need to control all the risk factors too. So high blood pressure, which often these individuals have, needs to be controlled. Uh, if they are uh, obese and if they have sleep apnea, which is very commonly seen, uh, a significant portion of my patients with atrial fibrillation have sleep apnea. Uh, often their spouse knows it and, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, some of these patients don't even snore and they have sleep apnea which was previously silent, which is detected by a sleep test and essentially treated by uh, uh, CPAP, which is very effective treatment and often a lot of these patients burden of atrial fibrillation goes down with that as well. So in other words, I'm looking at the patient as a whole, uh, looking at other conditions, treating that and if despite that they're feeling unwell, then such a patient is then a good candidate for the procedure. In other words, uh, after a trial of medications controlling all of the other conditions which could be contributing, if despite that they're feeling unwell, then they are good candidates for the procedure. What about uh, this patient? Should we offer AFib ablation to this individual? Uh, often as we age, a lot of changes take place in the atrium. So the atrium, there is a lot of what we call fibrosis. That's doctors speak for uh, uh, some strands uh, which get deposited between the cells which impair conduction. And the procedure that we currently perform in most EP labs of pulmonary vein isolation doesn't address that. So currently, if this patient has persistent atrial fibrillation, in other words, is in atrial fibrillation all the time and doesn't have much symptoms from it, my answer to that individual is no. Uh, you're not a good candidate uh, because a lot of changes have taken place in your upper chamber. Your upper chamber is big. We often check on ultrasound how big the upper chamber is. If you're not feeling unwell, all that we need to do is reduce your risk for stroke with blood thinners and give you simple medicines to make you feel better. Having said that, there is no black and white uh, answers. I mean, uh, I'm oversimplifying things. Each patient needs to be uh, reviewed uh, on an individual basis. And then patients ask me, okay, this procedure is good. You're saying this is effective and I'm suffering from this. Are there any risks with the procedure? Like any procedure, this procedure also comes with risks. Fortunately for us, in the, over the decade that this is being performed, the risks of this procedure have reduced over a period of time because we know about what problems can be caused and we go about addressing those. So it is a safely performed procedure uh, taking, uh, taking, of course, uh, uh, good technique. So what do our professional guidelines tell us? So essentially, uh, uh, treatment gets initiated, trials are performed, these trials are reviewed, and then we have these professional uh, guideline, uh, guidelines committees which review all the treatment options and give recommendations to uh, 
say primary care physicians, cardiologists, and even electrophysiologists is what the current data is. So in before, uh, uh, more than a decade ago, in AF manage management guidelines, these seem very complex because your doctor is addressing a lot of issues before he or she is deciding how you need to be treated. And ablation therapy was reserved for a minority of patients. Things change, as you can see. If I go back to 2000, if I come, come forward half a decade, in 2006, now ablation was recommended if you didn't have structural heart disease, then doctors speak that you don't have any other condition, just atrial fibrillation, you had to fail some drugs before you could go there. If you had heart failure, you, you needed to be on some of these medicines. If you had blockages in the arteries which supply blood to the heart, what we call coronary disease, you needed to be on some of these medicines. And if you had high blood pressure, which a significant percentage of patients do have, you needed to be on these medicines before you could be offered ablation. Things have changed now. Now, the most recent guidelines actually for patients who do not have structural heart disease, this is almost first line treatment. So the way uh, I proceed with my patients who are referred to me is that I initiate them on drugs to keep them in normal rhythm because the patients who get referred to me are individuals who are not feeling well in atrial fibrillation. The doctor has already tried the simple rate control drugs. I initiate them on antiarrhythmic drugs, bring them back to normal rhythm or let them stay in normal rhythm for a significant portion of the time readdress number one how well they feel in normal rhythm and if there's a significant gap between how they feel when they are in abnormal rhythm versus how they feel in normal rhythm then I talk to them about ablation therapy. So over the years uh, we've learned a lot about atrial fibrillation we know that this is with the aging population with uh, more individuals having high blood pressure more individuals being diabetic uh, significant population uh, being obese, uh, a lot of patients are going to suffer from atrial fibrillation. Of course, we can make a dent by having a better lifestyle, avoiding uh, uh, carefully treating the risk factors of high blood pressure, uh, uh, carefully treating diabetes, uh, having a good diet and exercise regimen on avoiding uh, weight gain or, or assisting with weight loss. And once we are in atrial fibrillation, one of the key issues as we mentioned is about stroke risk reduction with blood thinners and uh, in introduction of medications which are broadly either rate controlled medicines or rhythm controlled medicines and there are uh, various ways your uh, physician is going to decide what is best for you. And some patients who continue to have significant symptoms are good candidates for catheter based therapies. In other words, procedure to help take care of this common problem. So essentially, uh, there is a teamwork approach for managing individuals with this problem because uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, they have a wide spectrum in which they present uh, right from feeling totally well, which is incidentally discovered versus feeling unwell and they have underlying heart disease uh, which uh, uh, we may pick up during evaluation. So with that, uh, I'll close my presentation and uh, thank you.